Well, this is a great crowd. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Nikolai, for that introduction. We are glad to be here. I didn't realize it was our 20th appearance here at the Clinton School, and a number of you have been with us through most of these talks, and so thank you for being here, uh, and thanks to our panel today. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, uh, and we'll start on the far end. Uh, hey there, my name is Ryan Berry, and I'm playing Caleb in The Whipping Man. Uh, I'm Gilbert McCauley. I'm the director. Hi, I'm Michael Shepard, and I play Simon. Hi, I'm Damian Thompson, and I play John. Hi, I'm Dick Williams. I'm not in the play. <laughs> my my uh, only qualifications for being here uh, happen to be that I am a student of history, and I am Jewish, both of which, which uh, were deemed qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, uh, Michael and Damien are new to the rep. Ryan, if you saw Clyburn Park last year, Ryan was in Clyburn Park. He played, uh, you, what? Yeah, sure. I did not have this beard, so you might not recognize me. I'm very proud of this. It's taken a couple months to get here, but we're here. Um, and yes, I played Jim and Tom, um, the preacher and the lawyer in, in both of those last year. So. And this is Gilbert's seventh production at Arkansas Rep. Gilbert comes to us from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, and uh, if you've seen G's Bend or Frost Nixon or The Piano Lesson or a Soldier's Play or Fences, uh, you've seen Gilbert's work at Arkansas Rep. And we are very glad to have Gilbert back. And Dick, we're very glad for you to join us as well. Thank you for giving us your time today. Um, the Whipping Man is one of the most interesting and complex plays uh, that uh, we've had the privilege of producing at Arkansas Rep. You're seeing uh, some slides that our marketing team, uh, Lauren and Allison, put together, uh, and it, it sort of talks and touches on some of the themes. I guess that's going to just kind of continue to roll, which is, is good because we'll be touching on almost all of the themes that pop up, although we did throw in a few slides of Little Rock, and the play has nothing to do with Little Rock. Um, but. Let's begin by talking about why the rep is producing The Whipping Man. If you'll, well, Monday, we celebrated Robert E. Lee Day. Uh, and um, we submitted a grant to the National Endowment for the Arts to support our production of The Whipping Man. And an, 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 uh, an application to the federal government for funding requires a, a, a personal statement from the artistic director. And in my statement, I wrote about Robert E. Lee Day being celebrated here and why it was important to have this conversation and also why I thought it was important because I didn't know of any other instance where the African-American community and the Jewish community have the opportunity to come together and break bread and have a conversation. Um, uh, and, but we did, I talked a lot about, about Robert E. Lee Day and what that means to be one of the few states in the country uh, that acknowledges Robert E. Lee Day as a state holiday. Um, and uh, why the themes of the, th of the Whipping Man were particularly important to discuss in that context. Um, I also made the point in that letter to the National Endowment for the Arts that this is, that Arkansas is also the only state that celebrates as a state holiday an African American woman. Uh, and I said that's really, I think, in many ways sums up a lot about what Arkansas uh, says to the world. Uh, it's sort of the, you know, it, well, there's many ways you can look at that, the two sides of that coin. Of, you know, the Bill Clinton, Mike Huckabee coin, or the, the Robert E. Lee, Daisy Bates coin. Um, and then, uh, so I made that case in the letter uh, that I sent to the National Endowment. And uh, then you notice yesterday there was legislation introduced, uh, bipartisan legislation, to repeal Robert E. Lee Day. And of course, as that moves forward, when I send the follow-up letter to the NEA, I, I will take credit for uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that the project that they supported, in fact, led to the repeal of Robert E. Lee Day in Arkansas. <laughs> Uh, uh, and so uh, we, we always seek to make the, uh, make the best of our situation here. Um, let me begin uh, with Gilbert. Uh, talk about the origins of The Whipping Man, the play itself, written by Michael Lopez. Um, talk a little bit about, because you, you've seen it in other iterations. Yes, I have. Um, so Matthew, Matthew Lopez, actually, he, um, um, I think that in terms of what I've uh, understand that the, the idea was one that came to him after kind of doing some of the historical research. So the idea blossomed from that and um, finding out that the weekend that uh, the Civil War, uh, the, the weekend that the Civil War ended, 
uh, that time was also the time of Passover, and so that uh, that he thought those, the two of those things kind of coming together, that, the, that basically uh, this time when the United States left slavery behind was also a time when uh, Jewish people were celebrating um, the leaving of the leaving of Egypt and the, and the, and the, and the, and the Passover that, that's, that, that that was about. And so that part of it was the germ for the writing of it, and it continued to grow, and, and um, I understand he was also in communication with a historian, uh, Jonathan Sarner, who uh, Dick is going to talk a little bit about. And so that was part of the growth. And so it's been around, for, I think, since 2006, Six. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been done a lot. And I think it's been done a lot because uh, the Civil War is a, is a really interesting uh, time in United States history that we, to some degree, still are a little bit, um, uh, I think, we don't talk about it, really. I mean, we, do, we, we study it in history, but we really don't get into what that meant for us as a nation uh, and what we grappled with during the war and what we were then forced to grapple with after the war. And so I like the play because it really is kind of that place where the United States realized, well, we can't go back, but how do we go forward? And we're still figuring out, you know, how we go forward. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right about this. Uh, um, the Whipping Man was first premiered in 2006 in New Jersey at the Luna stage. Uh, it, and the reason a lot of people haven't heard of it is because it never had a commercial production. It never went to Broadway. It had an off-Broadway production at Manhattan Theatre Club that was extremely successful, but they didn't transfer it. Manhattan Theatre Club transfers many of their productions to Broadway. The show didn't transfer to, to, to Broadway, and so therefore it didn't win Tony Awards and didn't garner that kind of attention. But it is today one of the most produced plays in the United States, and it's one of the few plays that I can think of, really, that takes the Civil War as its theme or as its genesis for uh, um, uh, the, the storyline. There are very few plays, which you think about the most tumultuous, most dramatic time in American history, and there are very few plays set in that era. Uh, and if you, you know, if you haven't heard of it, it is a uh, story of three men, uh, and it's set in Richmond, Virginia on the 12th, 13th, 14th of April, 1865. You know those are some of the most significant days in American history because we all know that Lincoln was assassinated on, on Good Friday, but we often forget that that was Passover. Right. Uh, and uh, so that, as you mentioned, the playwright, Matthew, uh, uh, Michael Lopez. Matthew Lopez. I'm sorry? Matthew. Matthew Lopez. I almost gave you credit for writing this play. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, used that piece of information to tell a story of a Jewish Confederate officer who returns to his home in Richmond to look for his family, but instead finds two men that were former slaves of his families, and what happens, the secrets that are revealed in their story. The other interesting takeaway, we often think, when we're talking about the Civil War and we're talking about slaves and we're talking about slave owners, our mind often goes to Gone with the Wind, that we assume we're on a plantation. Well, the other interesting spin of this play is it is not set on a plantation. It is set in an urban environment. It is set in Richmond, in a townhome. Uh, and we know what happened to Richmond at the end of the Civil War. We know that the Confederate soldiers fleeing Richmond set cotton on fire, set, set storehouses on fire that set off munitions around the 2nd of April that decimated the entire town. Um, we know that Lincoln visited Richmond on the 4th of April, uh, right after Richmond was, uh, was abandoned by the Confederate troops fleeing the, uh, um, the army. But let me, the, the interesting thing, a lot of people say, well, I didn't know there were Jewish Confederates. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, but Dick, let's talk about that. You've read the play. Most of these folks haven't had a chance to see it. We've had two previews that have been extremely well received. But Dick, does the play, is the play grounded in, in, in fact? <clears throat> Bob, the play is extremely grounded in fact. We're all accustomed to uh, dramatic liberties being taken 
in order to improve a, a story. There's a controversy going on right now about the movie Selma, also the movie JFK, going back a few years. But it, this play, more than any other play or movie or novel that I have ever encountered, is grounded in history. And there's a reason for that that, that the audience might like to know. Uh, Matthew Lopez, when he wrote this play, uh, contacted Jonathan Sarna. Now, Jonathan Sarna is the chair of, of the Department of American Jewish History at Brandeis University and is the foremost historian in the field of Jewish Civil War uh, history. And he collaborated with Matthew Lopez actually in writing the lines. And it's uncanny how you can read the play as I did and then read some of Sarna's essays and his historical material and see the source for this detail or that detail in the play. So yes, it is, <laughs> it is spot on, huh? Yeah. This, this, this is spot on. Now the family is named De Leon, which a lot of folks don't look at as necessarily a Jewish name, but it is a Sephardic Jewish name. And not only that, but there was a De Leon family. They didn't live in Richmond, it's not this family, but there was a De Leon family from Savannah and Charleston that was very prominent during the Confederacy. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the De Leons served as Confederate ambassador to Spain in an effort to get Spanish support for the Confederacy. And you'll see uh, in the slides, we've got a lot of Richmond rolling up, but you'll see um, slides of a cemetery in Richmond. It's uh, the, uh, the Confederate Jewish military cemetery, the only Jewish military cemetery in the world outside of Israel, um, and, uh, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned Charleston, which I think had the largest population of Jews prior to the start of the Civil War. Right. A, a lot of people are surprised to learn that Jews owned slaves. Uh, generally speaking, in Arkansas, J Jews did not own slaves simply because they could not afford to. They had not been here long enough to, to be able to buy slaves. Char in Charleston, South Carolina, Jews settled 100 years before Jews came to Little Rock, a hundred years. And during that period of time, and also to some extent in Richmond, they were a Jews were able to succeed in business to the extent that they could afford to buy slaves. And that's just the reality of the situation. There were actually a couple of Jewish regiments in the Confederate Army. I mean, enough to form their own regiment. But they were, they were from South Carolina and Alabama, where, where there were more Jews than in Arkansas. And I understand that at one point Lee got a request to uh, furlough the Jewish soldiers for Passover and he declined because he thought it would weaken too many regiments. Yes, that's true. Gilbert, uh, with, in this context of history, as a director, do you feel that burden going into the process? Do you feel like you have to understand and know that history? Is that, what's your relationship as a creative artist to history? Well, I think the, there is that need to know the history, to understand kind of the context uh, of the world, because that's the world of the play. Um, but you want to know it for really specific reasons, because there are people that inhabit that world, and it's really important for us as the, as, as the, for the actors and, uh, and everybody in, involved in the production to really kind of understand who those people are, because that's who you look at on stage. You know, you're not looking at the history. You're looking at you're looking at the people, and you're looking at the relationships, and you're trying to understand uh, what's going on with them. So, understanding that that historical context is, is important. Understanding a kind of a, the the, a, the culture that's that's alive that was alive at that point. Those things are real important for us to kind of to to dig into, uh, so that we understand who these people are. And I, I was telling the actors when we got started, you know. It, it was, it's real important to have good actors for this particular, I mean, it's always good, to have, it's important to have good actors. <laughs> but, I mean, for this show, it's really an actor, it's an actor's piece in a way. Um, because we know, we, we get some, we are told the history, the, the text tells us some of the history, we know some of the history, but we don't know who those people were. And so, really trying to understand 
what the, the, the themes in the play mean to these people is, is I think what's important. And that's, you know, so that's, I, that's the reason to want to know the history, but it also, I think, makes the, the play that much richer uh, in that sense. Good. Yeah. See the picture of the $2 bill up there, the guy on the, on the right side? That's Judah Benjamin, who was, among other things, the Secretary of State for the Confederacy, uh, the second uh, senator of Jewish, uh, the second Jewish senator to serve in the United States Senate, and the first, I guess he wasn't the first Secretary of State of the Confederacy, but he was the highest ranking uh, Jew in the Confederacy. Is that accurate? Yes, and he was, in fact, no, uh, number two in the Confederate government as, as Secretary of State. He also served as Secretary of War and as Attorney General. Mm -hmm. And then he fled after the war to England, didn't he? He fled out of a reasonable fear that he would be blamed for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Michael, let me ask you this question. Uh, um, in terms of preparing for the role you play, um, building on Gilbert's statement about, you know, the burden of history, how do you approach a character who is a former slave, who is Jewish, what kind of, you are neither, um, um, I say that and you're thinking, but I, no, um, <laughs> how do you prepare for that? What, what work as an actor do you have to do and how did all of you guys prepare to tackle this play and, and the fact that it's Passover and the things that are accompanying with that? Um, for myself, um, I knew of the play before. I'd read the play years ago when it was first published, and I always wanted the opportunity to play this role. And I had to come from Los Angeles to play it because they always get television actors or movie actors to play those roles in Los Angeles. Boo. Um, <laughs> But I am very, I'm very fortunate to be here with Gilbert and this cast because they're amazing people. Um, this has been a particularly hard role for me because I am not necessarily a religious person. Um, but finding what my uh, own personal faith is in this role has been very important to the character of Simon. And, you know, and what strengths that I believe in and transferring them over to this character has been very important. And as Gilbert could tell you, there were certain, there are certain places in the play that I had a very difficult time memorizing because it was sort of really against what I believed. And it was like, and we were, it was up until probably yesterday. <laughs> um, <laughs> and hopefully it'll be there on Friday when we open. But you know, it's been, it's, so it's been a very difficult task, but I love the challenge as an actor. Uh, in terms of the historical context, you know, we all know what we were taught in eighth grade or fifth grade or, you know, your, the 11th, what is it, 11th, New Year, 11th grade, you have to take the, uh, the constitutional test or whatever it is. You know, but when you start digging into the history of the Civil War and realizing that in, terms, in context of slavery, that there is this 267 years of slavery right here, and then from 18, even thinking about it from 1865 when slavery ended to 1965 when the Voting Rights Act happened, that's 100 years, 100 years. That's, and it just blows my mind that there was sort of this wandering of no one knowing what was gonna happen, what, what the black community was doing. There was a wandering. And once you start digging into that and then realizing that the Voting Rights Act happened in my lifetime, I'm going, wait a minute, you know, it's, it's very, just very peculiar. But once you start getting into that history of what it is, things just start happening in your body and you start like really feeling it. And you start asking the ancestors to like, sort of like guide you through the path of what, what these men went through during that time period. And that's sort of my thing. It's just like, you know, I like to just sit and meditate and just go through what that journey could have been. Oh. <laughs> Hi guys, um, uh, my, my process I think was a little bit different. Um, I'll preface it by saying that I, I was born in Jamaica. So I moved here when I was nine. And um, so I have a little bit of a, like, just a different take on, on history in this country. It's, um, it's all kind of new to me, you know? Um, so I, I, 
kind of had to research the civ civil war because as Michael said, you know, we, we, we learn certain things as we grow up in school. And I, I think I came around um, fifth grade or no, sorry, like third or fourth, fourth grade. So, um, you know, I, I got a, a bit through uh, school, but I had to um, continue my own research in that regards. Um, I was raised in Miami. I had a lot of Jewish friends, so a part of that helped in this process. Um, I teach at a Jewish camp um, each summer for five, five weeks. Um, so, like, you know, just being around the whole, like, ritualistic nature of it and, and all that was really help, helpful. Um, but to be honest, I think the number one thing for me was the actual script. Um, I've, I've wanted to do, to do this show for over two years. Um, I've auditioned for it five times and <laughs> have been the runner-up five times between me. It, it, it was one of those things where, you know, my agent was like, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's between you and one guy, but it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Um, so I've, I've had a lot of time with the actual script, and it's just, um, to, be, to be honest, like each time I read it, I found something new. Each time I, you know, auditioned for it, I dove into it, I found something new. Um, it's a testament to also Matthew on just the degree of, like, research and the degree of, like, knowledge and um, talent he has as a writer, you know? Um, you get a good script and that's half your battle, you know? And a good script is not as common in today's time as it was, you know, a few years back. So um, I relied heavily on the actual words as well. And I believe this was his first play. Yeah. I believe that, that, that yeah. this is not, the, the playwright has since gone on to, is, is writing plays that are being produced now, but this play, Whipping Man, was his first. He's a young man. Very young. Man. Yeah. Ryan, let's come down to you. You have the, the added burden of, of being a uh, Confederate officer who is grievously wounded. And so that limits you in certain ways in terms of how you, the choices you make as an actor because in, you're immobile in, through most of the play. Yeah. How, does that, how do you work on that? What, what's the process like for you playing this, this Confederate officer who's been through the hell of war and has, has against all odds, managed to crawl home? Um, it's actually very, it's actually that um, not being able to move is actually very useful. It sort of fuels, um, it fuels a lot of his arguments and it fuels a lot of his like emotional, um, his emotional states because he's so helpless and has to, I mean, this is a, the status is totally shift. He was the son of a, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to get into this uh, as, as an actor living in, you know, 2014, but, or 15, but he was the son of a slave owner and he had control over these two guys. And all of a sudden he, he can't move and has no control and has to listen and has a lower status. So that fuels a, um, a very specific space in which he lives. Um, so I, I'd say that it's help, helpful okay. in, in that, yeah, in that sense. Uh, you know, and, and there's, as we're, we talked about this back in the, in the green room, there's a, some amount of this we, we don't want to talk about because the play has a lot of secrets and a lot of twists and turns in the plot that I think are more interesting if you discover them when you come and see the play. So there's a few things kind of plot-wise that we're dancing around. Oftentimes we have a conversation about a, uh, a script or a play that you've seen before, that you've read or you've seen on stage, you've seen a movie version, and so there's a common assumption about what's going to happen. Uh, this is a different animal, but we're at the same time trying to be respectful of the, the fact that when I first read the play, it was a page turner. I didn't stop reading it. I just kept, you know, I sat down. I, well, and I, you know, I don't like to read plays. Um, that's, that's supposed to be funny. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, um, but uh, um, I love to see plays. I love to go and experience plays. But it's a, it's a burden to read a play for me. Uh, and usually I read them and put them down and surf the internet and fall asleep and pick them back up and, you know, so this one not the case. I, I sat down and read this play and turned the page and turned the page and turned the page. I wanted to see what happened to these three men. Uh, you know, in some ways, do you know the, the play No Exit? Uh, about the, the, the men who are trapped in this undefined location and even though they could leave, they can't leave. 
in many ways, as I see this play unfold, I'm reminded of sort of the classic, uh, you know, existential drama, No Exit, because these guys <laughs> seem to be trapped uh, uh, in this world, as Gilbert mentioned, of uh, uh, where we don't, know, we don't know how to move forward. We can't move back, and we don't know how to move forward. Right. And that's what makes the play so fascinating. Um, but I also wanted to, to give a shout out to Jan and Larry Allman and to uh, Gene Levy, because um, when these guys arrived, we talk about this historical context. Well, one thing I, I you know, a satyr figures prominently in the storyline, because it, as I mentioned, it's, you know, the take, play takes place over Passover. And so um, Jan Allman, uh, if you know Jan, you know she's an amazing cook, and she offered to prepare a Seder meal for these guys. Tell us about that evening. What did, what did you do? Uh, what happened? We ate such amazing food, and we're put, and we're, uh, we, we, it informed the, the, the story of the, sec, of, the, of the play and the second act so much because we were able to understand the, we actually went through a Seder. Um, Rabbi Levy uh, led us through a Seder, and so we were able to ask questions, as, you, as you're supposed to as, as a Jew in a Seder. It was incredible, and the food was unbelievable. She's got this, um, what's that, mat what's the, um, she calls it something matzah. I don't know if I should, I should, she calls it crack matzah because it's that good. <laughs> yeah, I think the, um, that experience was really helpful for us as a group because, it, as you know, the themes of what the Seder is, what the, that celebration, what it is really celebrating, that this was, is a, it's at the heart of the play. And I think that's why Lopez uses it. I mean, he's really, it was really, it's really well crafted uh, in that he uses it because it's about, the, the play is about what does freedom really mean? And that the Seder is a, is, is, a, is, a, is a ritual where you actually wrestle with that. You actually have to deal with that. You have to actually say, yeah, what does freedom really mean? And I love the fact that it's, even though it's about history, that it's also about present time. And so that we, you, you know, the, the Rabbi Levy talked about the fact that yeah, people, you're encouraged to ask questions during a Seder, uh, that it is, yes, it is about coming out of Egypt, but it's also about what, you know, where, you know, about us now. What is freedom for me now? And making people, making people who participate in it kind of think about that in, in, in some real ways. And so we had, a, we had a wonderful time doing it. It was really very in, informative. Um, they all ate a lot more than I did. I didn't. <laughs> no, I went home so full I couldn't get up the next day. But, uh, uh, but no, it was, uh, it was a wonderful evening. But I think that I, I learned a tremendous amount uh, from, from that experience. And I'm really indebted to uh, Rabbi Levy uh, for, and Jan and, uh, uh, for what they did that evening. Yeah, I think before for us, I mean, for me at least, it was kind of a, when we went through it, it was kind of a generalization, you know, like, and you can be as, ritualistic as possible and put yourself in that mindset, but actually having gone through it and coming back to it, it's like night and day. It's the difference between experiencing and sharing an experience versus imagining and, ex and sharing that, you know? Plus I think for us it, it, as actors, we wanted to be completely respectful and needed, because <clears throat> some of our, uh, you know, I think all of us have been to a Seder before, but you know, we wanted to make sure that all our pronunciations were right. That we, you know, that we didn't want, you know, the Jewish community coming in going, hmm, you tried. <laughs> and we appreciate you trying, but. Um, so it's like, so, but it was just, you know, making sure that we were completely respectful to this faith and making sure that we knew the importance of it, you know. I mean, we all did, but making sure that that sort of lived within our bodies. You know, when we're doing, when we're create, recreating a Seder on stage every night. It's, you know, it's a very beautiful reverential moment. And it's, and what's great, because usually when something, so something happens like that on stage, people are like talking or maybe they're whispering or something. But when it starts, you feel the entire audience just go, okay, we're starting. And there's this weird silence. And you're like, okay, we're in control of this silence. Don't mess it up. You know, so it's like, so it's a really beautiful moment. And um, I hope that you all will come and see this play and sort of share these moments with us. 
um, because I love the fact that this room is filled. They're talking about how great it is to have all these people coming to this um, sort of talk today. But we're hoping that your being here today will actually generate ticket sales so we would see all of you in the audience in the next uh, two and a half weeks that we're performing this show. So do I have a guarantee from all of you to come see the show? Raise your hands. <laughs> I'm also a th I also manage a theater in LA, so that's how I'm going. We need your money. Um, so thank you, though. Here you go, Bob. Thank you, Michael. That was. <laughs> I won't have to say all that now. <laughs> now, here's an interesting thing I found. I found we've had two preview performances, uh, well attended, uh, incredibly vocal response, and lots of laughter. So, Gilbert, here's the question. Um, uh, the Confederacy, the ruin of Richmond, slavery, <laughs> uh, terrible wounds, comedy. Um, well, uh, you have to blame it on, uh, I'll blame it on the writer. Um, but no, I think that there is a, you know, I think whenever you have a subject, every subject has kind of two sides. So there is the, there is the, there is the, the tragic side of what's happened, and I think that's very apparent on stage. And then there's also just the human spirit that, that um, is always, in some way, trying to transcend, it, trying to transcend um, that tragedy. And so I, it comes through quite naturally. It's not forced. I don't think he, I mean, it's not written to be a comedy. I don't think in any way that it is, it, that, that it is a comedy. But I think that there is humor in the human experience that 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 organically comes out uh, when we deal with things. Those that, that that's that happens often. Um, but I also think that you know that the 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 laughter is is because the audience has to grapple with this as well. That they're they're in there wrestling with us, and so I think humor comes out of us sometimes when we are struggling with things that. Uh, that laughter is something that is a tool that we use to help us deal with it. So I think that it's there on purpose, and hopefully helps allows people to 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 sit with the play in a way that allows it to work on them, as opposed to kind of pushing it away because it's too painful. Uh, I, I think that's the way it works in the show, at least. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the moments in the show are relatable. It's like we see ourselves like, yeah, we, we, we aren't, you know, from that time period and we aren't necessarily those specific people, but these situations are relatable to our everyday lives. And I think that's where a lot of the humor comes from. Cause it's like, oh my God, yeah, that's kind of like me that, or like, that's my mom right there. You know, like you, you, you get, you see yourself a, a bit on stage, which is again, a test, a test, a testament to Matthew. We're all just wondering which part of the play is like your mom right now, but that's, uh, um, <laughs> um, it should be called the whipping woman. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ask that question. The play is called the whipping man. Nobody gets whipped in the context of this play. Gilbert, why is the play called the whipping man? What's the relevance? What's the significance to that? If, if that's something that I don't no. think that reveals great aspects of the plot, but why do you think that the playwright called this play The Whipping Man? I, um, well, I think it's actually a kind of a, it is a, um, the title, I think, evokes uh, something that uh, was a part of what made slavery possible, it, it, because it, it you know, you, you didn't have slaves just willingly going into servitude. People had to be dominated mentally and physically to get them to do this. And so um, it's important to kind of understand what structure made slavery possible. And, and the whipping is the whipping, this, this, the, the domination that it take, that it, that, um, that that represented, I think is a real important aspect of the, is a real important aspect of what, what happened before. And so that um, we reached this turning point where now 
um, these men won't, the, the men in the play, uh, Simon and, and John, uh, that that structure no longer exists. And so because I'm not being dominated in this way, now what do I do? I think that, that turning point is important. I also think that there's something about, um, the, I mean, we, we, we dealt a lot with this whole thing, the idea of whipping and, you know, what, it, what in our own experiences, you, you know, th those kind of things came from and what, it, what that meant. And I think that, um, I, I, I don't think you could do the, I don't think you could do that time justice without really dealing with some of the harsh realities of what kept slavery, uh, kept, that, kept that in place. And so it's more representative because there were a lot of things that were done to kind of keep that ha happening. But, slave, but the whipping, I think, is representative of how, did, how, uh, how people were uh, kept in that state. And interesting, something that, that, that I, I thought about the other day, you know, when, again, when we think about slavery in the South, we think about the plantation culture. And in the plantation culture, there was an overseer. There were employees there present. And if, if there was, you know, if, if they wanted to impose their will on somebody and wanted to whip them, mm -hmm. there was an overseer or somebody right there mm -hmm. who could do that. But here again, we are dealing with an urban situation where the men who are enslaved in the whipping man are not field hands. They are they 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 have um, their their lives are not based on physical labor, and there isn't somebody in the family who is going to meet out that torture or punishment, and so it has to be outsourced in an urban environment. And that's something that was interesting and revelatory to me, mm -hmm. the sense that there is this, this sort of uh, boogeyman out there who could inflict torture on you at any time for any reason. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, I think what we discovered is that there's an aspect of terror to it, and that's, that's partly what, um, that, that's partly what allows someone to dominate is that, 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 that use of terror, that use of, that use of uh, the, the specter of torture, of, of, what, you know, of what you could face. And so that's why, you know, that's why, it, was, that's why it was used. And it was used, it was a, a widely used practice. And it's been, and we've had it with us since, you know, since the Romans, you know, we've had flogging. We even have it today. We were talking about the other day that, you know, there's uh, a, a blogger in Saudi Arabia who's, who's been accused of uh, some crime and they, they're, 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 he has to face 1,000 lashes, I think, so he's going to be in jail. 3,000? I think it's 1,000. I think it's 1,000. I don't know. I it's think a it's 1,000, but it's a lot. Over, over, yeah. Meet it out over, meet over a period, a period of time. Meet over a period of time, yeah, yeah. So, so, and, that, and that's, so that the, the fact that we, we use torture and we use uh, this, this terror in a way to keep people from doing to keep them from doing what we don't want them to do. And that's, that's I think, the, 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 the reason why he uses it in the play. Let's open up for questions. That was fast. Yes. Uh, are, are we going to do mics? OK, here they come. We'll go over here, and then we'll go over there. As a as a frequent small investor on Broadway, um, I'm intrigued that this has been played so many times in regional theaters and was off Broadway but hasn't transferred to Broadway. Do you have uh, an idea of why that is? Well, you know, the only reason any project goes to Broadway is to make people money. Um, and I think the subject matter, I don't, you know, even if Denzel played <laughs> you know, Simon, I don't know that this project, anybody would see this as a commercial project because of the subject matter. Um, I think that certainly Manhattan Theater Club, among the most savvy nonprofit theaters in America and the recipient of numerous Tony Awards from transferring plays to Broadway, uh, certainly if they, if anybody thought there was a way to make money, commercial money off of The Whipping Man, they sure would have done that. But, you know, it's, it, and there are a handful of plays 
Um, and there are adventurous plays on Broadway. There have been adventurous plays on Broadway. Uh, but I think that this would be a hard one for the tourists. You know, Lion King, Whipping Man, Lion King, Whipping Man, probably Lion King. And it, I mean, sorry, and it, and it did have, it did have a pretty good run at the Manhattan Theater Club. And it's a little different from musicals from straight, uh, versus like a straight play where there's another institute called the Playwrights Horizon where there's a lot of plays that, that go there and get a lot of success and will go on and do very well regionally as well. Um, that it doesn't necessarily need to go to Broadway because, I mean, it's had a pretty good run where it is and uh, the audience that it's gonna reach on the next level, it wouldn't be that much different. I also think that for me is the conversation that the play elicits. I mean, you know, we might not be having a conversation like this if it were about the Lion King. Uh, I think that, you know, like I said, you know, the the Civil War, that whole time period, what uh, what what that whole thing was about, is something we you know we still dance around to some degree, and so. Uh, it, the possibility of having this conversation, I think, in a way, is better in the hands of regional theaters and, and, and places like that where conver the conversation can happen. Because it's not, for me, it's, it's not just the show. I mean, um, it's great to have a show. It's great to make, great to ma make money. But, it, but, but what theater allows is a possibility for communities to come together and actually have conversations. And uh, I think, that may not necessarily be the purpose of Broadway, is you know, to bring people together to have conversations. I think it's a, that's a, it has a different focus. So I'm you know, really happy to be you know, associated with, uh, with Arkansas Rep because I feel like they find a way to do things that, that are meaningful. Yes, they can do ELF and, and this. And that's a real important thing because we wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, you, you don't get as rich a conversation, I think, in, those, in, a, in a Broadway setting about shows like this. And mm -hmm. that, that's why I think like I said, it may not be Broadway material, but it's definitely real good theater material. Dick. Speaking as a theater goer and, and not as an expert, I, I would answer that by, by saying that when I go see a dark play like Sweeney Todd, I can walk out and say to myself, that's not true. That's, that's fiction. It was dramatic. It was interesting. I, I love the music. Uh, I love the singing. But it's basically not true. It, it, in, in England, people did not get chopped up and put in pies and eaten. But in, when you see this play, you're not going to be able to walk out and say, this didn't really happen. This did happen. That's a very good point. Yes. Is the title about the, the boogeyman that kept the slaves on site when, when Ryan was gone? In other words, why, why, what kept where, him there? Where the slaves stayed, where, oh, maybe the rest of the family was there. I don't, I don't well, know. Well, I, I guess. But, but the, the, they, they were still there when mm -hmm. they might have taken well, off. And, and right. the whipping man was the boogeyman. Well, that kept right, them. And, and that figures prominently. But what's keeping them there in the context of this play is this is a, basically a rendezvous point. Their, their families have been scattered. And they're hoping that they'll find, they're either trying to, you know, when all hell breaks loose, where do you want to go? You want to go home, whatever you know home to be. And their family, it's in this time of war, there's refugees, there's chaos and they can't find their families. So I think they're coming home, they're staying there, they're kept there because they're hoping their families come there. That's what keeps them there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, I mean, it's a major point of change. Um, like a lot of things are changing at this time. And I mean, the characters don't necessarily know where to go or what to do. So you kind of stay where you are comfortable until you can make a choice to move, you know, to go where you want to, which is what's in interesting is that making that choice is what becomes this show, you know, and how they make that choice. Did you have um, a question? The Whipping Man itself is something that I think throughout 
their lives, this character is in the for you know the foreground. Um, but it's not what keeps them there during this whole process. Yes. This is mostly a question for, for Dick about your historical research, but I'll just preface it by saying, um, and I have read the play, one of the strangest things about this play, if you're coming from a perspective of someone who's Jewish, um, is the fact that you have people who have converted or come from a non-Jewish origin to be Jewish. And that's strange because Judaism doesn't place a lot of emphasis on conversion. It's interesting as part of the theme of the play, right, that there's not this belief that you need to push the religion onto everyone. But yet, we have uh, slaves here who have converted. Um, one of my questions is, what's the historical evidence um, for slaves converting or not to Judaism? Mary Ann, that's a wonderful question. Thank you very much. We were discussing that backstage before we ever started here. There is not any direct evidence of slaves having converted. And the reason for that is that in every southern state, there were severe criminal penalties for teaching slaves to read and write. Therefore, if your slave converted, there was a presumption that they could read and write, and that's why they converted. Now, why does anybody think that they did convert? A temple in Richmond, but shortly before the Civil War, adopted a rule that no slave could become a member. And the rather, uh, uh, well, the reasoning is, if no slave ever converted, why would you have to have a rule like that? So the fact that the temple in Richmond had the rule has given rise to Jonathan Sarna and a number of other Jewish historians saying there is a de high degree of probability that some slaves household slaves, not field slaves, but we're talking about household slaves, over a period of time, having cooked a number of Passover meals and having heard the prayers, decided to convert. Other questions? Yes. It sounds as though that the, uh, there's a fairly high intellectual level uh, of this discussion and um, uh, since it's an urban environment uh, and the slaves are there, uh, have they actually had schooling or is this something that's simply been learned as a kind of a part of their experiential uh, mm -hmm. activities? I'm going to let Damien, you know, yeah. the, the characters in the play, talk about, because they, they talk specifically about this in the play. Yeah, um, there's, I mean, there's, there's wasn't like an actual school where you know the slaves were sent were sent to but what what would would happen most times is the owners of the house would take time to teach the slaves like how to read how to write you know or to convert if they were um engaging in that process um and i mean you know and, and you'll see like they're both there's good and bad things to what's hap happening, and um, without giving away too much, you'll see it in the show. You'll see, you know, some of the, con the consequences mm -hmm. or some of the results of what can happen when that practice is mm -hmm. taken. And I, but I think that it's important to just underline, you know, it was illegal to teach, to teach, uh, to teach uh, slaves to, to read and write. Uh, so that, that part of it made it something that was kind of always undercover and so it didn't it wasn't it wasn't widespread also uh, those slaves who did learn to read and write often taught others which is the, is, is kind of how that 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 uh, that was handed uh, that was handled uh, but it wasn't I mean the the severity of the crime for anybody who was uh, who uh, either taught someone how to read and write or, or a slave who then did learn to read and write uh, those were the things that, that, that kind of suppressed uh, the practice. So in, in the play, we definitely, yeah, we definitely deal with it. Uh, but the, the fact that it's an uh, urban environment uh, and that uh, slaves had more access to, to books, to, you know, to learning, there was a lot, it, because of the urban environment, it, it's just more probable for them to, to learn. Um, but like I said, it was it was definitely illegal, and so and, and frowned upon, severely frowned upon. There's, there's, there's also like I mean a, a a question that came to me during this process, and I don't think I mean I, 
I don't think there's a definite answer, but for me, one of the things that I wondered was, you know, why would someone do, do this? You know, why would someone want to teach um, their slaves or why would they want to convert their slaves? And, you know, and I, I mean, I had an, uh, a thought and it's just, I mean, it's one, not necessarily be the thing, um, is that there is a possibility that there can be a bit more loyalty in that. You know, if, if someone feels like you and them are sharing the same faith or you and them are, you know, that, that, that there's some kind of more personal interaction where you will have a, a, a lot more loyal, loyalty from that person, you know. Um, that's just one idea that I had. Well, it's interesting. The play deals with sort of generational shifts in the slave population. Uh, Michael's character represents an older, Michael's character doesn't read, Damon's character does, and that's a source of tension and something that bounces back between them. And also, Damien's character is really, you know, one of his jobs is to be a playmate to, uh, you know, the, the son of the owner. And so there's a lot of conversation about, you know, them sitting in their room reading um, because it serves the purposes of raising uh, Ryan's character. Um, and books figure prominently in this play as well because that's knowledge, that's forbidden knowledge. It's one of the things that Damien's character seeks out in this time of chaos is this sense of forbidden knowledge that he seeks to acquire now that he can. And that's so the whole idea of reading and knowledge is a, is a, is a through line throughout the play. Other questions? No, you guys are easy. <laughs> yeah, well, the, you know, and I will say this, because the, the play, once you see it, you're going to want to talk about it some more. And so we have established uh, several nights during the three-week run where we'll be doing post-performance uh, conversations in Foster's with guests, with the actors and guests, uh, who have knowledge that helps us come to a greater understanding, uh, like Dick's wonderful contribution uh, to our conversation today. We're doing a conversation with uh, uh, our friends over at the Mosaic Templar Center, the cultural center there. We're doing uh, three conversations in Foster's. One will be hosted by uh, Carl Moneyhan, who is a Civil War historian at, at UALR. Um, and then uh, Tuesday night, our Jewish Federation night, we have conversation that night as well. Uh, so there are lots of opportunities to engage with the actors and with experts um, at the rep, uh, because exa exactly what we're talking about here, this play begs for dialogue. And that's something that theater can do and something that theater needs to do. And so the reason we're producing The Whipping Man at the Rep is exactly what Gilbert said, because this is a conversation that we believe is important for our community, and we believe the Rep needs to be a facilitator of that conversation. And so with that in mind, I hope you'll come down and see the play, um, I hope you'll tell your friends to come and see it. Um, I really appreciate the participation of our panelists here today, and I very much appreciate you all being here today. Thank you so much, and come see The Whipping Man. Thank you. Thank you.